So why did the World War II Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, as one of the only air forces, not talking about the navies, but only the air forces, develop dive bombers? Well, I will tell you, and just to put the obvious out of the way, it has nothing to do with close air support. To explain all of this, I'm gonna take you back in time, and then I'm gonna start by the end of the video of putting all those threads together and give you a good rundown of why dive bombers were a very German occupation during World War II. Now, so welcome back to Military Aviation History. My name is Chris and I talk about all things air power, new videos every Thursday on MAD, Military Aviation History Day. So let's jump right into it. Why dive bombers? Well, we need to go into the 1930s. In fact, you could argue we need to go into the 1920s, but we will go into the 1930s instead. 1933, the Nazis take power, and 1935, they unveil the Luftwaffe. Now, by this point in time, the Luftwaffe has already built up a sort of conception of what it wants to do, and it puts all of this into a cohesive document in 1936, which is called the LDV, or Luftwaffendienstvorschrift, or Druckvorschrift, depending on how you actually want to say it, 16, 16, Luftkriegsführung. And that's their official doctrine. Now, what goes into this document? Well, we have to look at the situation that we have in Germany at this point in time. So in 1933, when Germany decides to build up the armed force again, it has no air force. So it needs to build up an air force very quickly, and specifically, it needs to get the numbers of airframes it has up to the point where it can theoretically at least uh, combat its neighbors. Now, in order to do this, it starts a massive reinvestment program into the aviation industry, which at this point has been progressing very clandestinely and very much sort of focused on single engine machines and trying to have some developments here and there abroad, for example, in Sweden, and a little bit of stuff happening also in the Soviet Union, interestingly enough. Um, but there is no real force to draw upon and there is also no industrial capacity to draw upon. So while you're trying to build up a lot of aircraft into your force, you don't actually have the industry that can support that sort of build up. So there's a massive reinvestment program that's happening, but the industrial constraints become very obvious very quickly. And in the mid 1930s, the Germans already know that even though they have, for example, these aspirations of building up a bomber fleet of four engine bombers, um, the technical standards of the time in Germany, as well as the industrial capacities, simply don't allow it. Now, the Germans at this point in time definitely say that the bomber is the key tool of an air force because it's the bomber that strikes the targets on the ground. It is a very bomber focused force until 1944, in fact. However, because they know that they can build up this fleet very, very quickly, and they also have the manpower constraints in order to you know, facilitate the crewing of big machines, they start to think about ways to get around this. At the same time, what you also have are technological constraints, not just in terms of, for example, engine technology. Germany does catch up very quickly in that regard, but there are still some severe limitations in many ways because they haven't been really developing engines for at least a decade and they've lost time. And uh, the other technical or technological constraint is bomb sites. Bomb sites by the mid 1930s are really, really bad. And though, though by the time that World War II comes around, we have the Loftus 7, this is a German bomb site, as well as the Norden bomb site. You know, in, in practice, these work really, really well. And that's also where the reputation, for example, for the Norden bomb site comes from. However, in, in once you actually put that into an operational environment and you have to throw, you know, as people are shooting at you, if there's cloud cover and so on and so forth, the accuracy that you get is really not that good. And the Germans look at sort of this technical trajectory and they say, well, bomb sites are not going to give us really the accuracy that we need in order to destroy certain targets on the ground. Not all targets, but certain targets on the ground. And on top of that, there is also the geopolitical situation for Germany. Germany in the 1930s knows that it is basically surrounded by nations that it eventually wants to um, take territory away from because it, you know, the Nazis considered certain territory, for example, in Czechoslovakia or in Poland, German. So they know that there is going to be an armed confrontation with these countries, and there's also going to be likely an armed confrontation with France. And the one thing that Germany always wants to avoid is a two-front war, because a two-front war is very, very bad for a country like Germany. Primary adversaries that Germany foresees for the future is Poland, well, first of all, Czechoslovakia, then Poland, and then France. Britain does not compute for the Luftwaffe until about 1938, 
and even then it foresees you know that an armed confrontation with Britain you know once that one that Germany is going to start is not going to happen until the early 1940s so within that continental war perspective what you need is to knock out at least one adversary on either side of Germany as fast as possible. So either you take, for example, Poland out of the equation or you take France out of the equation. Because what they, uh, Germany expected is that if there's a two-front war, both sides would launch offensives at the same time and Germany can only defend against one of them. Now that's not what happened, but that's what they assumed would happen. We have all of that. We have the need to build up an air force quickly. We have industrial and manpower constraints. We have the technological, um, technological constraints of the time. And then we have this uh, need to knock out at least one adversary quickly. So the answer that Germany has is doc the doctrine. Uh, Luftwaffen, Dienstvorschrift 16, Luftkriegsführung, which I already talked about. In there, you have three main elements. You, the Luftwaffe wants to destroy the enemy air force. It wants to support the Heer, the army on the ground, the, its operations, not in close air support, mind you, in interdiction missions and it wants to destroy the Kraftquellen or the sources of power of the enemy country. And in doing so, it wants to have a decisive effect on the war, a Kriegsentscheidende Wirkung, like a war deciding effect. Which is interesting because at that point we're already starting to see sort of this crystallization of air power as strategic effect. Uh, which is very different to the sort of this idea of just sending strategic bombers. You, know, you want to have achieve effect on the ground rather than mount strategic raids, if that makes sense. Now, this doctrine, as you may have already noticed, is very broad. In fact, there's, for example, a historian Coram called it sort of a compromise solution. Uh, Homs, I believe, said it is sort of a crystallization of all the different theories that were out there. And it's it's not really revolutionary. It just says like, well, th these are the things that are out there and these are the things we can do. And But however, in within Luftkriegsführung, the Germans say, we need to have a Schwerpunkt, a center of gravity. So the Schwerpunkt is going to be the one where we focus our efforts at any given point in time in order to achieve strategic effect. Now to achieve effect within that Schwerpunkt and going back to the constraints that Germany has, you're seeing it's starting to come together here, you have the discussion. Do you want to have tonnage over precision or do you want to have precision over tonnage? Because at the time that was basically your choice. And Germany knows it can't build enough bombers, certainly not the big ones. It wants to, but it can't just yet. But at the same time, it must ensure the rapid and the lasting destruction of targets on the ground. So how do you get as many bombs as closely as possible to the target to ensure that destruction? And how do you scale that to many targets? And the answer to that in terms of the Germans was, well, we're going to dive bomb in small formations and we're going to take out specific targets on the ground, point targets, yeah, Punktziele of Deutsch, um, and the area targets, the Flächenziele, those are going to be the bombers, but the dive bombers are going to do those Punktziele. The dive bomber in this sense is supposed to take out electric substations, bridges, vital parts of a factory, you know, a specific building, for example, in a factory, or it is supposed to take out ships. It is not supposed to take out tanks, maybe large bunkers, but even that's already a stretch. But it is really about having specific effect on a very small target, but which still has an area that is not necessarily the size of a tank. It has to be bigger than that, okay? Uh, in fact, in the, in the uh, training regulations of the JU-87, what we have is a target size that is being practiced on, and that is 50 by 50 meters, right? So basically 100 feet by 100 feet, which is quite big. It's not a tank size. You can fit a lot of tanks in there. So it's really about locating specific points on the ground that you need to take out. And within that, the dive bomber is mainly meant to enhance the capabilities of the bomber force. It's considered the sniper amongst the bombers, the Scharfschütze unter den Kampffliegern. And that tells you everything about how the Germans wanted to use them, or conceptualized the use of them. And that is to get the most out of a small number of bombs 
delivered with high precision. However, Germany only builds about 350 Ju-87s before the war starts. Uh, 1939, when they go into Poland, they have roughly 1,200 bombers. And the bomber effort is their main effort. And yes, as they're you know, fighting and as also to go into France and so on, they start realizing, well, the, you know, the dive bomber and the precision it offers, that always more and more closely ties it into the operation of the army. And eventually you go from this approach and the, you know, we're in the 40s right now, 42, 43, we're going into this from this sort of strategic perspective on the air war to the tactical perspective of the air war. However, initially that was not the case and it's really the initial period in the 1930s that set out why the dive bombers were a thing. And there we go. Now, the discussion you can have now is was this correct or was this wrong? Um, you know, in hindsight, it's it's very easy to uh, to uh, make judgment. I would say that it's very interesting. I think that the Germans very early on put a strong emphasis on achieving strategic effect in their theory of how they want to fight in the air war, and I think this is overall speaking correct in how air power is supposed to be used. It has to be very dedicated, targeted, specifically employed in order to support both operations on the ground or the war in its entirety. And tactically speaking or technologically speaking, you can also see good reasons of why they went with this approach. However, where Germany goes wrong, and this is you know, the subject of another video entirely, where Germany goes wrong is that it is focusing too much in the end on delivering precision in these tactical missions and not enough or doesn't focus enough on providing these strategic conditions where these actual operations that are then playing out on the tactical level um, can actually uh, play out in. It becomes a reactive defensive force that races from one flashpoint to the other without ever creating the conditions to employ air power correctly. Um, you know, the air power matchup is essentially lost in the West in, you know, late 1943. And in the East, the Luftwaffe hangs on, depending on how you want to qualify that statement, maybe until late 1944. But that's a completely different beast and a completely different video entirely. So there we go. That is why Germany goes with dive bombers. It has nothing to do with close air support. It has all everything to do with the initial conceptions of how they're going to have to fight a war in the future with the restrictions that they had in the 1930s and with this requirement to enhance the capabilities of the bomber fleet by providing a platform that can deliver within that time frame precision strikes on dedicated fixed target of a small circumference. If you want to know more about dive bombers and you speak English, you can uh, buy our book on that, Stuka, The Doctrine of the German Dive Bomber, crowdfunded by all you legends there of in the military aviation history community. And if you speak German, you can also buy this from our actually crowdfunded conference as well on the Second World War. There's five articles in here about targets, I mean tanks, and one about close air support and the German uh, development of close air support during World War II, written by yours sincerely. And uh, yeah. English, German, and if you speak both, you're in luck. Thank you very much to all of you for listening. And if you have any questions or want to make any additions, put them in the comments below. Big thank you to Patreons and channel members for sponsoring this channel. And as always, I'll speak to you about air power in the next one. Take care and see you in the sky.